day in paradise in sunny, sunny, hot Las Vegas. Oh my goodness. I did not do my run outside today because it was 94 degrees. No way am I going out, even at 5.15. No, not this morning. Anyway, <laughs> it's a hot one today. I think uh, they said some winds are going to come in and maybe take some of that heat away, but we shall see. Then we'll be in a convection oven, I always say. <laughs> so what's going on? Lots of things, lots of things. We have 25 days of inventory, uh, almost 26. Y'all listed uh, 162 uh, homes yesterday, including 132 single family homes. That's a wonderful thing. So you put 98 under contract, we closed 70, and we are August 5th, where let's see, we had uh, a Sunday in there. Uh, we're doing 112 closings a day. So not bad, not bad. So we are happy, happy, happy. Now, I'll slow down for just a minute because I finally went in and I did the median price. And guess what? It went down. I'm so happy. I knew July was hot. I never did go up to the 405, uh, even though it, uh, it ended up in July at 405. I think we all um, felt that, felt the heat and the multiple offers and things that were going on. So yes, we, we kind of knew it was hot in hot, a hot July. Hopefully that'll be the, the hype. And now it's back to 389 or 390. Whew. And uh, I think it's going to soften a little more, everybody. And at the end of the day, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Sellers are still making a lot of money, a couple thousand dollars of, of uh, additional equity they won't have is not going to stop them from selling with all the equity that they do have, right? So I think that we are in very good shape going forward for the next five months and let's make it, let's make the next five months just shine, okay? I think we can do it. I think we're going to do it. I want to address another issue and I'm moving a little bit quickly because I have a slideshow I want to show you today um, that Applied Analysis did and, and perhaps you saw it, perhaps you didn't, but I picked out some relevant slides to try to make a point. So we will do that uh, quickly here. So, but I do want to address the, better turn my phone off before I get my uh, normal spam call, right? <laughs> there we go. Um, Sorry about that. I know I should put it in airplane mode, but I don't. Um, let's see what do I want to address. Okay. A lot of talk about the non-owner occupied um, sales and people coming in here and just grabbing our homes. And we're going to have this, uh, this over, uh, we're going to be overtaken, I guess, by hedge funds. So the non-owner occupied sales year to date <clears throat> represent 31% of our sales. Now, People, you know that in Vegas, we do have a large percentage of renters because we have a large percentage of non-owner occupied. I went through each quarter that I have listed here. If you see down here in the lower right-hand corner, January through March, we did 2,971. April through June, we did 4,500. And already we've done 1,900 uh, July and August through August 5th. So it looks like these numbers are going to continue to probably remain about the same, especially with the rents being high. But we do need rental properties and renters, what? They become buyers. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. But here's the thing I want to address. I went through, I alphabetized each quarter by the owner. And I maybe I saw a small handful of, let's call them the big companies, people that bought more than five or 10 properties. There's only a handful, not even five that bought more than 10. So I think that so far we, we are good. I mean, um, Blackstone hasn't gone out and bought more properties. They already own a lot of properties here. You have to think of that in perspective to what people are saying. Yes, across the country, it might be a big deal, but Vegas was the number one foreclosure town. And the hedge funds came in and bought up a lot of properties. They own a lot of properties. They own a lot of properties and they will eventually sell those properties and take their profits. So I think that 
maybe what's happening across the country um, because interest rates are so low and the government is just, you know, giving money away, whatever, however your perspective is from, for, for those um, non-owner occupied sales. But I think in Vegas, that's already happened here. I think that, you know, the hedge funds have already, and the REITs have already come in, the real estate investment trusts, they've already come in here. And now they're sitting on their homes, they're renting their homes, and they're looking to cash out at some point. So when I see, and actually when I see that, you know, the, the prices are going down a little bit, they might start selling and that would be good. That would be good. We need more inventory. So I think that, you know, at the end of the day, we're in good shape here. And that's basically my message today. And I want to, to follow up with, um, by in saying that with some slides that applied analysis did. Let me hide this for a second and let's, let's look at this uh, in, in a bigger slate. Just to end the uh, statistic part of the show, in July, it topped at 405 for the, <clears throat> excuse me, median price. August, we're already lowering it down a bit. We're down to three, it says 389.995. I think that's like 390, right? So I don't think this is going to stop your sellers because if you go jump up here to June, it was 395 in June, 385 in May. I think we're going to hover between 375 and, and uh, 390. I don't think we're going to see. Good morning, Frank. Good morning. Good morning, Frank. Good, did I don't know if you heard my explanation about why I think that we're not going to have um, as many hedge funds coming in here because they were already here during the foreclosure period and they already have a lot of holdings. And I did do, I did review the numbers. Um, Frank, I just want you to hear this. If you heard it already, I'm saying it again. Uh, I did review the numbers. You know, there's 31% non-owner occupied homes here in Vegas. A lot of that is because of, of uh, you know, the, oh, you did hear it. Okay, good, good. Then we'll move on because we have a lot to go over this morning. And what I did is I took some of the relevant uh, slides from the applied analysis presentation that they did back in March. And if you saw it, fantastic. Uh, I know there was, that's like a, a fire hose <laughs> going in your mouth of information. So today I just picked out a few slides. I'm gonna go rather quickly because I think that what I want you to, uh, to listen for and to think about as we go through these slides is how, are, how is this information going to help your business? How is this information going to help your business? Not just help your business, but how is it going to help you shape your business? Are you going to change your direction? Are you going to, um, are you going to happy? Oh, by the way, happy birthday, Teresa. <laughs> I meant to say that in the beginning. It's Teresa Stratus' birthday. Happy birthday. Um, and you look half your age, I have to tell you. you beautiful girl, beautiful. Anyway, I want you to, to, to look at these slides and think how these things are going to affect your business and not only affect your business, but is it going to reshape your business? And how can you get this information out to people? Now, we're Kane and I are putting together a blog using some of these slides um, because we want the uh, and, and normally we put it at the end of the month, but the end of the month happened to happen on a Friday and Kane was off Monday. So we are a little late in getting our July blog out, but it has to be good. It may be late, but it will be good. And we're taking information from various sources and um, NAR hasn't really come up with anything new. So I had to, to dig uh, really deep this time and I wanted it to really be impactful. So hopefully um, this will help you know where your business is, where it might be headed. And just, you know, what, what are we gonna do with our uh, business here? So let me get to where I need to go. I think I need to solo this, right? <laughs> I need to go to here and I'm gonna do a check everybody real quick because I wanna make sure you're seeing what I want you to see. So hold on just a second. Hold, 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 let me get back to Facebook here. Doesn't go back to where I wanted sometimes. So I'm doing a, I'm doing a check here for volume. So let me make sure you can hear me. Come on, come on, come on. You must be able to hear me because I, Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, good. So here's slide. Here's the first slide. 
And it says the financial health sentiment among American travelers. Okay, I'm starting with our industry, of course, because that drives our economy. And compared to a year ago, 30% of people are almost 31% are financially better off. And 53% are unchanged. So there you have like 80, 84% almost of, of our population here among American travelers being just fine. 16% are, are worse off. And of course, because of the unemployment, we can understand that. And I think those people that are financially worse off probably helped maybe family members and things like that who were, who were suffering. So they maybe use their savings and things like that. But 71.1% of American travelers have money left to save this month. Now, that's big. So the people are going to travel that have the money, and they're still going to have money. And 38% of American travelers believe now is a good time to spend money on leisure travel. So there's how your 100% of the economy uh, plays out. High probability of travel, we have pent up demand and pent up capital. So that's going, and that's going to continue. Now the types of travel. Now this is from uh, April, if you look down here. So we're looking at May, June, July. And this is basically what happened looking in the rear view mirror. The leisure was 52.4%, 36.8% visited friends and family. And I think sometimes these two blend I think that when they do the statistics, the leisure and the family and friends blend a little bit. And then we have almost 14% for business and group meetings, 11%, like conventions, like seminars, people coming like uh, Tom Ferry's here, other people, Grant Cardone. Uh, you have, uh, I think the EXP convention is going to be here in March or in November. So yeah, so, you know, you, all of these things really touch Vegas. Now, the percent of Americans who will travel for leisure in the next three months. Wow. Now, if you look, this is, and of course, they, they looked back. So where are they heading? They're heading to cities. 41.3% are heading to cities. That could be us. Beaches and resorts. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, beaches. We don't have a beach. But we have resorts. So we're part of this as well. So we're part of that 86% or 76%. So 76% um, of the 100% of Americans who will travel, they're going to come here. And then America's most desired domestic destinations. Guess what? We're number three. We're number three. So, and this, this was as of April. So this is relevant statistics, very relevant statistics. We're number three in the desired domestic uh, destinations. And, you know, there's some good things that came out of COVID. And one of the things is that people don't want to travel um, overseas right now. They'd rather travel in America. So this 12.3% is really a, a bigger number than it might have been uh, two years ago. Because this says domestic uh, destinations. Okay. Let's go now to the convention years. Hill told a virtual audience on Thursday, and that must have been in April, that research the organization has conducted found that 91% of prospective convention years say they are burned out with Zoom meetings, and 77% are longing to return to Las Vegas for trade shows, meetings, and conventions. There you go. I mean, people have done their research to give us confidence. We are confident that the conventioneers are coming back. And uh, many other, many other, uh, not just um, this particular organization, uh, the LVCAs uh, did their research, but other organizations have said, you know, that they as companies are returning to Vegas and they can't wait. And they're probably gonna have more people than normal. Love that information. So the Las Vegas Convention Visitors Authority is investing nearly $9 million to sponsor six sporting events at the Allegiant Stadium over the next five years. Huge. That's going to bring even more people here. Keeping our economy vibrant and alive. 
October 22nd to the 24th, the Las Vegas Motor Speedway sold out in 12 hours. Wow. So they, they're having, uh, they're having uh, their Speedway events in October and they sold out in 12 hours. And I'm sure if you remember, I talked about the Garth Brooks, I think what was that, July 8th or 10th, something like that. It sold out in minutes. It didn't even take hours to sell out. And now when we look at January, this coming January, the 5th through the 8th at the Las Vegas Convention Center, a thousand companies have committed already to come to Vegas. And of course we have the, uh, the Tesla with the underground uh, tunnels moving people faster to their destinations. And I think that's just going to make it a much better experience and people are gonna be happy they're back here. We've got the world resorts, um, I think that we have a bright future is my message. We have a very bright future. Las Vegas is set to come out of COVID better than ever. And CNN Travel said that. That's not only pent up demand. There's pent up demand for the unrivaled Vegas experience. Um, and this is from the, the vice president, uh, Lori Nelson Kraft of the Las Vegas Convention Visitors Authority. We anticipate visitation to Vegas growing stronger, with each passing month. We are offering more. New things have opened up. Um, Cirque, the Cirque du Soleil is back. Um, the Circa Hotel, the, the Virgin took over Hard Rock uh, and World Resorts is a huge draw. And it doesn't look like it's hurting the other casinos. And that's what they're saying. We're drawing more people. Ha, huh. now where where is our money going? <laughs> Look at this, everybody. 17.7 billion in Southern Nevada's development pipeline. Now, if you've been listening to my show for a while, the last time I reported on the Southern Nevada's development pipeline, it was at 24 billion. But guess what? The resorts, that, the, that included the resorts world, which is already done. And uh, the Tesla tunnels, so those are already done. Um, it included, uh, and one other big thing, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but, oh, I think the addition to the, the convention center, they pulled that off. So there's 59 total projects that comprise this $17.7 billion total cost. And 29, um, are under construction. And 11.5 is, 11.5 is, um, under construction cost. I'm going to do another check here for my voice. There we go. Yeah. Okay. I get these funny messages. Sometimes you can't see them. I see them. It's like, ah. okay. So here you go. Um, and this is the, this is the, what's been completed, which is not included in the 17.7 billion, the cost here, or, you know, how much money has been spent? That place was 4.3 billion. And then the Jackie Robinson Arena and Hotel Project. Now that's planned. And I'm not so sure that's gonna happen, but we'll see, but that's 3 billion. The Sphere is definitely happening. That's under construction. The Google Data Center, the Union Village, the Gemini Solar Project, Henderson West, Majestic, uh, Uncommons, that's, that's going to be quite a uh, retail uh, residential center. Um, another hotel casino, an automation manufacturing plant. This is huge. $320 million to build an automation manufacturing plant. That's going to bring a, a whole different um, segment of the employment industry to our town. And we need that. We need to have a more variety of em employment categories here. And the Nevada Museum of Art, $217 million planned. I-15 and Tropical Interchange Reconstruction. And all these things are bringing jobs. And they rebranded uh, SLS. So I think some of this, these things have already happened. Um, downtown word, wor, <laughs> wor, uh, road work. Boy, I get my tongue twisted, don't I? Um, the monorail, the, a lot of construction on our uh, highways, which is good. Marriott's building, the Henderson Hockey Arena, the Bend, that's another uh, <clears throat> residential commercial uh, complex. 
Uh, we're building more on under UNLV, the North Las, the new Las Vegas Municipal Courthouse, downtown Henderson's doing construction. Uh, again, I see uh, the water pipeline to Apex, huge. That's going to, do you know what that is going to do to our industrial segment of our economy here? It is going to bring all types of uh, industry. We recently sold a piece of land. Uh, well, we've seen many pieces of land sell recently in Apex. And they're selling now because they know the water pipeline is coming and it's under construction. And that's what, that's what was uh, holding back the development of Apex up there. Now that's on the other side of I-15. <clears throat> um, it's on the uh, west side of I-15 past the uh, uh, speedway. So we have the monorail at the sphere. Uh, they're widening the beltway. And just look at all these different things. Smith's Marketplace in Henderson, Hotel Chloe. I don't know much about that. Uh, we're doing a lot of construction on the airport. The Skyline Hotel and Casino is expanding. The Neon Museum, if you haven't been there, that's quite a quite a place. We may do a show from there one day soon. Um, hotels, the more hotels, and they've done their homework. You know, they haven't uh, determined perhaps what what their cost is going to be. But Boyd Gaming, are you kidding me? Putting their Las Vegas headquarters here, I know that'll be a show place. And then the Brightline High Speed Rail, we don't know if that's coming yet, but it's on the docket. And then the Circus Circus Hotel and theme park renovations they're planning to renovate, which I think is a great idea. That place is very old. <laughs> it's been around, oh my, I think it's one of the oldest hotels on the Strip. So all these things that don't even have an estimated cost yet. I mean, amazing. A lot of hotels, uh, the Mardi Gras Hotel and Casino redevelopment Marnell West Henderson Casino. They're going to build a cas another casino out in Henderson. They already have the M. They're going to build another one. And uh, Herps is going to do a non-gaming hotel and a lot of uh, expansion and improvements on our infrastructure. So, so what does all that mean for us, everybody? What does all that mean in the housing sector? Well, if we have more people coming here, and you know what? When you see something and you go someplace and you like it and you meet so many wonderful people that we have here, the customer service is outstanding in the majority of the casinos. I've heard some bad reviews about one or two of them, but I think it was because they were coming out of COVID. But for the most part, all I hear is uh, people love this place. So the housing versus the economy. So the price per square foot comparison. Um, well, it's it's been in 2019 it was 175 dollars it's up to 200 dollars and that's okay so that's like what a 12 percent increase that's not that bad considering you know um the cost of living has gone up everything goes up and then the median price has gone up much less so the median has gone up just you know 13 dollars which isn't much at all per square foot so the, this, these are good numbers. We don't want this stuff to go too high because then we become un, unaffordable. And um, I'm going to the next slide here, which, uh, let's see, did I duplicate that one? Looks like it, huh? Yeah, okay, that's a duplicate. Okay, so here's what all this comes down to, and this is what the some of the information. So uh, first of all, you need to feel enthusiastic about our economy. It's hard to sell what you don't love or what you don't believe in. And so I wanted to show you these things, you know, all the projects, all the things that are going on in Vegas, so that you get a feeling that we're going to be okay, because I don't want to sell a house to somebody if I think our economy is tumbling down. Now we still have high unemployment, but that's going to change. Uh, the, the 2020 Las Vegas price appreciation map is something that you should share or use. Now the next three slides I want you to use when you think about you know, where you're going to market. I'm pleading for everybody to get a farm. I understand that, that everybody says the, the big guys are gonna come in and, and take 50% of our buyers and sellers. So we need to be experts in, in a, not in everything. You can't be an expert in everything, or maybe you can, but 
Very few of us can. Um, but you need to look to where prices are appreciating and, and show these things to people. Like when they want to know what where to live in town, um, this should have something to do with their decision. Price appreciation and why are prices appreciating? That's the question that you have to answer. Well, you know, a lot of this is increasing because of the, the development that's going on around these places to make them you know, uh, nicer places to live, more parks, more activities. You know, the over here in the Summerlin area, we have the Aviator Stadium now. Down in the Southwest, you have Allegiant Stadium now. So there's a lot of different reasons why different places on the map are increasing in value. And, uh, and you know, location, location, right? So then we have the price appreciation. These are the top 10 zip codes by price. So this may, if you're going to market to people, you might want to market to people who've had the best appreciation because they're going to have the most equity. And you can pick, you know, there's a variety of places here to pick from. And I was talking to uh, some people, oh, uh, I don't know, I'm always talking to agents and trying to help them build their business. But one of the things I was saying, I think it was in my social media class, is you've got to do your research. You want to pick a farm that, has appreciation that has people being in their homes five to seven years ready to possibly move um, areas where uh, you can get demographics on age so let's for example just a brief example here let's pick area 89044 and it's had seven percent appreciation and let's say that when you when you did your research you found out when you did the demographics that people in that zip code you want to know what their average age is because maybe they're in their fifties and sixties or forties to 50. And so they might be getting ready to downsize. So you have to utilize some of this data that you have to go out and get in conjunction with the top 10 zip codes by price, because these are the sellers. If you're going to get a farm, these are the sellers that have gained the most equity. Okay. So that's, that's the whole point of all this. Then I think I have one or two last things to show you. Now, these are the 10 zip codes by appreciation. So you might want to put these two side by side. And um, a lot of the homes that have appreciated, like 89146 has appreciated 20%. Wow, that is a big chunk uh, of appreciation. So, and the price there is like in the 3000s. So those people might get ready to move up, don't you think? Because there's a big difference between a $300,000 house and a $500,000 house, and they may be ready to move up. Again, figure out in that zip code, what's the average age? So if the younger people uh, bought in at a low price because they just got married, they were first time home buyers, whatever the reason, they might be ready to move now because they're going to have a family, get a dog, want a bigger yard, want <clears throat> more uh, space in the house, an extra bedroom so they can have an office. So all these things go into you determining where you're going to direct your business in the next uh, 17 months, this year and next year. Very important data here. And one of the things that we need to make sure that everybody knows is that we have Great lifestyle preferences here. Henderson's different than Summerlin. Centennial Hills is different than Henderson. The east side, Sunrise Mountain, is different than the southwest. So all these things, and you should be able to roll off your tongue pretty easily, the differences in north, south, east, and west, because they all have different lifestyles. If you live in the northwest and you like to hike, you might like that area because, you know, you've got Red Rock Canyon, you've got uh, Mount Charleston. Um, and if you want things in close proximity to you because you're a biker, or you're, you know, you're bicycling or you're running or whatever. So you need to, to think about these things when you're asking people questions about, you know, uh, in, you know, the person asking the questions, Jimmy always says, and he's right, has control of the conversation. But then the caveat is, well, how good are your questions? So when you're asking people that are moving here, people that want to move you know, from let's say Henderson, they want they want to go to the Northwest. Ask them about their lifestyle. Do they like to do different things that are 
the amenities in that particular place. Maybe they maybe they're baseball fans, so they want to get close to, you know, the uh, Aviator Stadium. Lots of things. And remember, ask good questions, and um, then we have limited resale availability right now, which is keeping the going to keep the houses at a you know at at a good price and low mortgage interest rates. So these are the things that are going to continue to keep our prices strong. I don't want them to jump up too much. We already had that discussion earlier, but this solidifies, this solidifies our economy and our um, housing. And housing is 18% of the economy. Don't forget that. That's a good stat to know. And then here's one last thing I want to tell you. Uh, because it's past my time, my half hour's up. We don't have a lot of people in Nevada with negative equity. We were hit the hardest, but over time we've gained the most equity because we bought really low. If you bought a house and in, in even 2011, the median price was 120,000, right? And now it's worth 390,000, let's say. Um, you've got $275,000 worth of equity. So this is why we don't have a lot of uh, foreclosures. And this is why we don't have people with 2.4%, everybody, shares of homes with negative equity. And this is something that's really important, very important for our future. Um, one other thing, let's see, I got one last thing. Uh, and that is we do have uh, a percent of renters at risk for eviction. However, what I've noticed, because we do have a property management company, most, I would say 98% of our tenants are, are uh, paying their rent. The other 2% are working out with the working out arrangements uh, with the owner, the landlord, so that they can keep their property. And so they're, it's kind of like a forbearance thing with renters. They're saying, I can't afford 1200, can you take 900? And most of the time, the owners are coming back and said, okay, yes. And the owners are generally saying that they're not asking for them to make up the 300 deficit uh, over the six month period, perhaps that they need to get back on their feet. So um, I think we're, we're in pretty good shape. Um, in the United States, uh, the risk is lower overall. Um, I don't know why that is. I haven't, uh, again, I didn't create this chart and this was as of March. Um, so a lot of people now that were back to work. So I'd like to see the new one now that people are back to work. Um, the strip opened up and I'm sure a lot of people are working now. So I think this is probably, um, uh, the bad, the worst it's going to get. I think it's probably going to get better. We're probably going to get closer to the national uh, average of, uh, it looks like about 6%. So that's not bad. And again, this, this is the good news because a lot of the people that own homes, non-owner occupied, have a lot of equity in their home. And so they can afford perhaps to, and they have a low mortgage because they bought their home back in the pandemic or not the pandemic, I'm sorry, the, the foreclosure time. So their payments probably, you know, not that high. If you bought a home for 120,000, even though it was 5%, your, your interest, I mean, your mortgage and payment and interest aren't that uh, high. So I, I think that that's why we're a little bit insulated from uh, having this affect our economy in any uh, big way. Well, I hope you enjoyed this today. Uh, it is uh, lots of good news here. Uh, you can watch it. I will put these slides in the group. Let me uh, go back to see you and say goodbye. Um, take that off. Put me back on. Um, goodbye, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day. And remember uh, to keep smiling, stay happy, be happy. Good morning, Karen. Good morning, everybody. I couldn't see the, the chat this morning because I was uh, on the slideshow. Hope you enjoy this information. Go out there and be happy, make more money, get your goals in place, and let's have a great 17 months. I love you all. <laughs>